it, Matthias, as well? <laughs> Great, so we're going live. And does that mean I can't finish my tea or? You have to start relaxing with these uh, different forums <laughs> and just carry on as usual. So finishing tea is always a good thing. And so tonight we're on, guess which, Anusati. So today is Sangha Anusati. I was almost tempted to, um, to instead talk about Chaga Anusati today because we spoke about it so much earlier on. Ajahn Brahm talked in great length about uh, reflecting and recollecting one's own virtue and goodness, but that's coming from me tomorrow. Um, but all these things really tie in together. So whether we're recollecting the Buddha Dharma or the Sangha, the purpose of this is really to try to deepen this quality of sadha, of confidence, inspired confidence, you know, which has this quality of joy about it and which can really help to brighten the mind, to brighten the mindfulness and to give us a kind of um, sustenance for the way. So I'm going to go a bit more into detail about how that works, but first I wanted to mention what the Sangha is and how the Buddha defines a Sangha. And um, using the simile of the physician, where the Buddha is the great physician and the Dhamma is the medicine that he administers, we can think of the Sangha as like the nurses or the attendants, the people providing comfort providing safety, providing companionship along the way. And they're people that themselves have gone through the treatment already. So they know the ups and downs, they know the bumps along the road. And uh, they can offer inspiration, something to emulate. They have certain qualities that we can really hold up in our minds and revere. You know, the kind of qualities that we can look upon with love and devotion and recognize the first flourishings of those qualities in our own hearts through seeing them in others who've developed them further than we have. And this is so incredibly uh, nourishing and comforting. In terms of the monastic Sangha, the Sangha also provide material, emotional and spiritual support. And uh, I spoke to my own teacher, Ajahn Brahm, today straight after the first meeting this morning with Ajahn Brahmali, so I felt thoroughly spoilt. And uh, the first thing he said to me was, um, you know, is it okay to talk now? Are you not tired? Like you've been teaching a lot. And I just said, gosh, it's a privilege. You know, it's just such a, a blessing to be able to talk to you during this retreat. And, uh, and then he said, we care, you know, we do really care. We want that you're well, we want that you're, you're okay, that you're not too tired and that everything's fine. And uh, I really felt it said in such a sincere way and it's that sort of companionship that comfort and that genuine care that really is um, such a wonderful support on the path and it shows us that we're not alone it shows us that other people understand what we're going through and they've got our back you know they've really got our back and I hope that all of us can do that for each other I think just before coming into this session we were saying that uh, every day we're having a silent meditation session and one of the people in the group just opens up the session, nothing is actually said, and people just come together, seemingly on the video screen, but actually in person, in a very mysterious way, and they sit together, meditate together, and there's a sense of holding and support. And people really find that very nourishing for their practice, very supportive, like a beautiful container in which, or maybe like a ship in which you're all helping to steer. You know, and the power of getting together in that way is just something that is much stronger than if we try to do it alone. And I think that also has to do a little bit with being able to let go, knowing you're in, you know, good company, you can feel safe. And it's not all up to you to generate the kind of energy for the practice. You can also benefit from the energy of other people's practice as well. So the Sangha in the Buddhist uh, Pali Canon actually means the Sangha of monks and nuns, the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. And today it's often used to refer to the whole fourfold assembly. In the Buddha's uh, day, he used the word parisa for that rather than Sangha. And one of the reasons is that um, because some of the qualities of the Sangha are described as being basically worthy, the Sangha are worthy of reverential salutation 
um, and Jelly Kalania, which means um, worthy of respect, but it's a particular kind of way of expressing respect, which is like an Anjali putting the hands together and bowing. And that was very common in ancient India, specifically for the monastic Sangha, the ordained Sangha. And that carries on even today in Buddhist countries. And uh, in India, it's changed a bit. Everybody greets each other with the namaste. And it took me a while to stop doing that to lay people. I still do it, actually. And I've been told off many times by people in Buddhist cultures, like in Sri Lanka and Burma, that that's not appropriate because it's still considered something that is um, for the Sangha who have gone forth into monastic life. And it's not necessarily the case, of course, that we're always more developed than another lay person who may have been practicing for their whole life, maybe have got attainments on the path. But I think it also points toward um, respect and reverence for enunciation itself. I think that is a big part of what we're paying respect to. It's paying respect to enunciation to giving up, to giving things away, to simplicity, to contentment, and all these beautiful qualities of freeing ourselves. And as I said, I wanted again to link this to the sequence that starts with, in this case, confidence and goes all the way into samadhi, and also just go through those qualities of the Sangha. So I'm reading here again from the Majjhima number seven. It's very similar to the one that Ajahn Brahmali is going to be reading out in the next day or so. And here it says that one acquires unwavering confidence in the Sangha thus. So then it talks about the qualities. The Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples is practicing the good way, the straight way, the true way, and practicing the proper way. So that means the path that they're on is leading directly to liberation. It's leading in the proper way. It's leading away from suffering and towards ever-increasing, refined, beautiful, noble, uplifting kinds of happiness, yeah? And then it said the four pairs of persons, the eight types of individuals. So this is interesting because this is actually a reference to the Arya Sangha. So it's more than just any monk or nun. It actually means those monks and nuns who have had significant attainments on the path, starting with Sotipati Magga, which means they're at least on the path to stream winning. And there's a slight difference there in the Abhidhamma because the path is considered to be like a mind moment before the fruit of stream entry. So the path occurs just a kind of micro millisecond before the actual fruit of the path. But in the early Buddhist suttas, it's a bit different. And somebody can be on the path, so it can actually be categorized as one of the Arya Sangha and yet not be, not really know it because it's not yet um, <clears throat> a very obvious attainment. <clears throat> it's not necessarily an experience, but it's basically, I mean, my understanding of that would be somebody who has practiced quite deeply um, to the point where their sila is really quite unshakable, very, very virtuous. You know, their character is changing or has changed significantly. And they're probably entering states like samadhi states, jhana states fairly easily because there are very few hindrances and their right view is really developing. So they say that if you are on the path already, you're bound for stream winning in this life. And if not in the life, then at the time of death. So it's a very high stage already if you're actually on the path. Most of us are practicing to be on that path, to get onto that path. But even then we're going in the right direction. So these four pairs of persons are basically those four stages of enlightenment, those who are on the path to that stage and those who have attained it. Yeah. And then it further says, those blessed ones, disciples are worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings and worthy of respect or this Anjali reverential salutation, an unsurpassed field of merit for the world. So again, this is pointing to monastics because monastics traditionally are the ones who receive offerings from the lay community. That's um, how they become this field of merit for the world that you're offering to the Sangha with a lot of faith in your heart, knowing that this is not going to an individual, but this is going to support the institution, if you like. I don't like that word too much, but it's going to support the purpose of the Sangha in the sense that 
somebody who's practicing the path and has practiced to the point of becoming a noble person is bound to spread and disseminate the pure Dhamma, the true Dhamma, and make that Dhamma fully accessible to all. You know, not only that, they bring it to life. They bring it to life, you know, just through the way they are in this world, just through um, even a conversation like the one I had today with Ajahn Brahm, I could see the sparkle of loving kindness in his eyes, you know, and it just gave me such a strong sense of comfort and support. It was really very inspiring and nourishing. And it's almost like around these people, our whole nervous system gets a chance to really relax, you know, because they've got a very regulated, well-regulated nervous system, and that has an effect on the people around them. That's from a scientific angle of course but there's other sort of more spiritual mysterious osmosis effects happening whereby we pick up on their kindness we pick up um, the aspect of non-harm the aspect of like Ajahn Brahmali said earlier we feel safe around them we feel so safe and we know this person only has our best interest at heart they just want for our happiness you know, they're not there to kind of assess or judge or evaluate us in any way, and certainly not in a negative way. I always have the sense that Ajahn Brahm is just checking to see if my path in general is going towards brightness. And, you know, if I go through storms from time to time, that's fine. He doesn't worry about that, but he just wants to see that overall I'm on the right path. And today he said to me, you know, I can see the change in the last two years. It's very obvious to me although it might not be obvious to you. And I think this is also one of the beautiful things about having spiritual friends that they can reflect this back. You know, they can reflect back what they see in us. And in the same way, we can emulate the qualities we see in them, you know, and just by holding those qualities dear, by holding them in our hearts and going over them, dwelling, reflecting on them, it brings up such a lot of joy. Ajahn Brahm's told me in the past, you know, that he's, found it almost difficult to continue doing these kind of recollections because so much joy comes up he just gets kind of teary-eyed and then he wants to go straight into meditation and it's just like straight in straight into deep meditation because it's almost like they blast away the hindrances you know this kind of faith this kind of confidence and the joy that arises it just overcomes the hindrances you know so easily so easily when we really get into it. I mean, how can you really be thinking about, you know, the Arya Sangha or say a Buddha and having like lust or a desire to harm somebody at the same time? You know, it, it's quite difficult <laughs> unless you're really not doing it properly or unless it's still, you know, kind of monotonous chanting in the morning when you're tired and you're just going through, iti piso bhagavara. You know, then, of course, it's possible the mind can wander somewhere else. But I think that's not the point. We just learn about these qualities to bring them alive in our heart and to start recognizing, wow, there really are people in this world that are worthy of deep respect. You know, not because they're wearing the robe, although still a lot of respect is due to the renunciation, but um, because of the way they're purifying and transforming their heart, you know, and they don't have to be perfect, right? Um, I think the main questions to ask <clears throat> are things like, you know, are they keeping their ethical precepts? You know, sometimes the conventional precepts for a monastic have to change a little bit according to time and place, but the ethical precepts, they should become part and parcel of who we are so that it becomes actually impossible to break the precepts at a certain stage on the path. So are they living a virtuous life? You know, are they serving others? Are they giving not through a wish for gain or fame or praise or even for a pleasant feeling for themselves, but they're giving out of a sense of, I have benefited so much. I feel so grateful for what my teachers have shared. I just want to share that with others. I want to convey some of that joy, some of that benefit and see others benefit in the same way. Yeah. And do they love and respect? Do they revere and try to protect the Dhamma? You know, do they try and preserve the teachings or do they prefer to teach something that's a bit different because it sounds funky or it sounds kind of like it'll be good for their business or something, you know? Or are they actually trying to be true to the Buddha's words and understand where these things are coming from and then protect them for future generations? Are they relatively happy, you know, compared to your average people in the world? Is there something of a glow? Is there something of a, a peace or at least a sense of purpose and meaning that you see in them that's very resolute, very committed, 
Mm. And I would also ask, especially of everybody, but especially of spiritual teachers really and monastics as well, like how do they treat marginalized people, marginalized communities? How do they treat women, right? Because the Buddha was interested in establishing a bhikkhu and bhikkhuni sangha. This was his wish. And he said he will not pass away until that has happened, until they're strong in the Dhamma, you know, because otherwise it's like you have a chair with like only three legs or maybe a few of the legs are wobbly. No one can sit on that chair. So the simile was that, you know, you need the fourfold assembly. As I say, he used the word parisa, not sangha, for the fourfold community of lay women, lay men. Uh, monks and nuns and so these four legs had to be there so that the chair would be solid and we can actually sit and take refuge on that chair for eons hopefully to come right so how do they treat these kind of people you know are they dismissive or are they trying to open up opportunities you know for people from different backgrounds for the black community or for people of color for people from the lgbtqia plus community how are they treating these people and there was a very nice story Ajahn Brown said to me recently um, about one of his monks. Um, before he ordained, he asked his mom about the ordaining because you have to have your parents' permission. And she said her first question actually was, well, how do they treat women in your religion? You know, and how does your teacher treat women? And he said, oh, well, actually, my teacher has taken this step to ordain bhikkhunis. And she said, OK, you can go. Yeah. And there was another woman Ajahn Brahm mentioned as well in the last few months. And he said that uh, she's a famous novelist apparently or a famous writer, but um, she was interested in Buddhism for a while, but she said that she observed the monastic Sangha in Perth for a long time over many, many months until she was actually able to, uh, confident enough to say that she was a Buddhist. It was only after observing and seeing, you know, what, where does this Buddhism lead? You know, how does it manifest in one who practices? Is there a change or not? Then she felt satisfied. She felt, okay, these people are living a kind and harmless life. These people are, you know, really serving the society in a meaningful way. And then she could describe herself as a Buddhist. So in this sequence, it basically says again, and I'll be repeating it, but it's good to hear it, I think, again and again. So it says, when one has at least partially expelled, released, abandoned and relinquished the imperfections of the mind. And also in this context, they're recollecting on the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha. They consider thus, I am possessed of unwavering confidence in this case in the Sangha. And one gains inspiration in the meaning and gains inspiration in the Dhamma. So inspiration here is the first step. That's slightly different from gladness because it's sort of as a precursor to that gladness, which is called Pamoja. But it's very beautiful. And I think inspiration is one of the best energy sources for the practice, much, much better than willpower or striving or over-efforting. And then when one is glad, rapture is born in them. In one who is rapturous, that's piti, the body becomes tranquil, pasadi. In one whose body is tranquil, they feel pleasure. And in one who feels pleasure, the mind becomes still. Yeah. So these recollections lead us all that way. Partly by hearing the Dhamma, you know, somebody today said they were so moved, they were having like tears of joy and was that okay? And again, it reminded me of Ajahn Brahm. I keep mentioning him because he's the teacher that I'm closest to and who has also this very soft heart, which is, you know, quite emotional, but in a very pure way. So only really pure emotions. And one time he was listening to a Dhamma talk by another senior monk. And he said, you know, he just had tears in his eyes. And the other monk turned around to Ajahn Pramali and said, oh, Ajahn Brahm liked that Dhamma talk, didn't he? And Ajahn Brahm said, and he was right. I liked it very, very much. <laughs> yeah, really beautiful. So, as I said, you know, it can blow away these hindrances and it can energize our mind so that it gives us this pure source of inspiration and energy. And of course, that feeds into mindfulness. The mind brightens up and we're able to see more deeply into things so that the mind, for example, if we do put that energy onto the breath, we see more deeply into the breath. It's not just a boring one more breath, you know, and the mind wanders away halfway through. No, it's this beautiful breath that you start to see so much kind of texture in. You see like the 
peaceful quality of the breath, the kind of very gentle quality, the kind of humble nature of this incredible breath that is keeping you alive. It's something so simple, and yet it is incredibly precious. And it's not only that it's keeping you physically alive, it's spiritually taking you further and further on the path. The breath, in a sense, is the Buddha's gift to us. You know, he prescribed this as the simplest and most, in a sense, perhaps pleasurable um, object of meditation that can take you all the way through the four Satipatthanas. And I am hoping also that Ajahn Brahmali will get into that, but I'll surely be speaking about that at other times as well. Because, um, you know, the breath meditation can really start to come alive at this stage when there is that PT involved and it becomes so effortless to stay with the breath. You know, you don't have to keep on directing your mind to the breath every time it goes away because it just wants to stay there. It's something that you can almost like revere in your mind, you know. So we can establish those beautiful ways of relating just by imagining the qualities of the Sangha in this case, you know, the qualities of a noble person on the path. And with that joy that arises due to that, or maybe with imaginations, recollections of their particular qualities, we can actually use those qualities to observe our breath. You know, you can imagine the kindness and the gentleness of a teacher who has purified their heart and you could use the same kindness and gentleness to watch your breath. Sometimes I even imagine that, you know, I am the Buddha watching my breath. It's not me watching the breath, it's a Buddha. And in that way, you know, you can imagine that there's this great gentleness around your perception. There's no judgment at all in there, right? <laughs> I don't know if I should say the next thing because it's on live stream, but I did once tell Ajahn Brown that I sometimes imagine I'm watching his breath and taking care of it for him, <laughs> which sounds kind of funny, but it doesn't matter because it's a skillful means. Because sometimes, again, you know, we don't value ourselves, we don't value our own breath, we don't value our own resources, but we value somebody else's. So if I imagine it's Ajahn Brahm's breath, and I know that his breath, you know, goes very deep into the deep samadhi, then I kind of have this sense of caring for it, you know, and revering it and really wanting to, like, look after it. So can we do that to our own breath, you know, treat it like a friend would or treat it as though it belongs to a dear friend. Another one I sometimes do, again, sounds a bit strange, um, is to imagine that I'm watching the breath of like my baby. Like it's the breath of a little baby that you've put to sleep and it's a very delicate baby, maybe in the first few weeks of its life and you're just watching it in the crib and it's like breathing in and out, just gently, 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 and you're watching it and you don't want to miss that baby's breath. You want to know that it's still breathing, right? And there's great comfort in that. There's a great sense of care. I've seen that happen with parents. They just mesmerized by their child, you know, because that child is so tender and so new, so precious, you know. So why can't we do that with our own breath? Just imagine you've never seen it before and it doesn't belong to you. I think this is the other aspect of imagining it's someone else's breath. It doesn't belong to you. So it's not your breath. You can't control it actually, you know, and you're not gonna worry too much either. Well, you might worry if it goes away, but you're not going to panic too much because you've already kind of put that distance between yourself and the breath. But anyway, before I get more into the breath, which I hadn't intended to do, but I guess that connects with confidence and joy and samatha, stillness. I did want to talk about Sangha as a Kalyanamitta because obviously this quality of spiritual friendship is a really important aspect of um of Sanghanusati, of recollection on the Sangha, because they are the real Kalyanamitta after the Buddha, right? After the Buddha. And of course, with a Kalyanamitta that's living, we have extra opportunities to discover and explore and be guided in the Dhamma through conversation for one thing, right? So one of the advantages, of course, is um, not necessarily for company, not necessarily for hanging out, because yesterday we were talking about the Dhamma, that it should turn us more towards solitude and away from company. So we're not sort of looking for Kalyanamittas and the Buddha's not saying that Kalyanamittas are the whole of the holy life because we need to have company all the time, but it's rather because they help us to recondition our mind. They give a different import. You know, they can actually tell us, for example, not to ask the question, who am I? but to ask the question, what do I take myself to be? 
Yeah, this is a different question that starts you looking in the area of where your delusions lie. So this is a very different way of looking at things. And this is what I find from associating with the wise that you know, they always are able to give a perspective on things that I haven't thought about before because I'm just too stuck in my own ways of being conditioned. And they've obviously been through similar conditioning but have come out the other side and been completely reconditioned with a different perspective on life. Sometimes I like to think of right view as kind of wise perspective. It's a perspective that's in line with the Dhamma, that's looking at things more in terms of phenomena, more in terms of cause and effect than things with an inherent essence, you know, that actually categorically exist. So there's a difference there in the way they relate to you, the way they hold things. And it's very beautiful because, yeah, the Buddha said we need the word of another as one of the prerequisites for stream entry. But not just the word of anybody, right? Not the word of your Facebook friends, not the word of, you know, even a well-meaning fellow practitioner, although it can be helpful, but we need the word of another, somebody who's seen the Dhamma um, further than we have at least, right? And ideally somebody who's actually um, attained to stream winning or above. And uh, yeah, there are a couple of little suttas I just wanted to quickly touch on about Kalyanamittas. I know Ajahn Brahmali already mentioned a few things, but um, there's a couple of suttas here. One is Samyutta Nikaya 45, number two. And this is the one where the Buddha says to Venerable Ananda that spiritual friendship is the whole of the spiritual life, not 50%. He said, don't say that Ananda, it's not 50%. It is the whole of the spiritual life. And often it stops there and we never ask, oh, why is that? But in that sort of it says the reason is because one with a spiritual friend, a Kalyana Mitta, it, it will be expected that they'll develop and cultivate the noble eightfold path, which is based on seclusion, dispassion, cessation, and maturing in release. So this is cultivating the noble path in a special way based on seclusion, dispassion, cessation, maturing in release. In other words, it goes all the way to the full goal of that spiritual path. And then secondly, he says that by relying on himself, the Buddha, and it would also mean Aryas generally, so the Sangha, the, the enlightened Sangha of monks and nuns, and also lay people, I would say, you know, in terms of the teachings, it doesn't have to be a monk or a nun, it can be anybody who's seen the Dhamma. It's just in terms of like respect and hospitality that we're talking about the um, the monk and non sangha. So he says, by relying on me and anyone who's seen the Dhamma, let's say by extension, being subject to birth, old age, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair will be freed from those things. And some of you might recognize that as the main part of the description of the second noble truth. That is the definition of suffering. So by relying on the Buddha, we'll be free from those things that cause suffering and those things at a deep level, because it includes birth and death, you know, which means includes rebirth. It includes the whole round of birth and death. And then there's another sutta, it's the Anguttara Nikaya number nine, number three. So Anguttara Nikaya nine is three. And here it talks about Kalyanamittas as one of the things that lead to the maturation um, where liberation of mind has not yet matured. In other words, at least the maturing of the path that takes us to liberation of mind. So if you're on the way, but your liberation has not matured yet, in other words, it has not ensued in deep meditation because here liberation I think is vimutti and it's usually referring to the jhanas, then kalyanamitta, spiritual friendship is going to help you get all the way there. And the other qualities of virtue, of course. And then another one, which is interesting is um, talk on the Dhamma and the talk on the kind of lifestyle that is conducive to opening the heart. And from other suttas, I can infer from that, that it's about talk on wanting little, talk on fewness of wishes, talk about contentment, all that kind of conversation is conducive to opening the heart and to taking you further on the path closer into those deep states of meditation. And I would say one more point as well, 
which for me is really important. And it's the Dhamma Sakacha. It's being able to communicate, being able to have discussion around the Dhamma. You know, the way we are to, in this retreat, and I think this is why people want to come on retreat, it's different from just reading the suttas on your own, because we can clarify, we can ask, you know, for clarification on any points that are maybe not clear or that need further explanation, or even any points of disagreement we can discuss, right? And um, I think for me, this is really important to be able to really probe into these teachings and clarify any doubts in my mind. And yeah, just today again with Ajahn Brahma, I was asking him for his for, um, preferred translations in things like dependent origination in particular. And uh, yeah, it was very encouraging to hear what he had to say because I was sort of inclining to those kind of translations myself. And um, one of the things that he said was, of course, to translate ignorance as delusion. That's his preferred rendering. But also where Bhante Sajato translated um, Sankara as choices, he said that actually volition is a much better translation because it's more about where these things are coming from, the inclination of the mind. So he said it's more like where you're inclining, you know, the general direction of your mind rather than kind of going to the shops and choosing the items on the shelf. <laughs> so that made a lot of sense to me because I think at this point it's still quite subliminal, you know, it's still not in the realm of really going about and doing your shopping and making choices in the world. But again, you know, this is different people's interpretation and it's so wonderful to be able to clarify and dig that bit deeper. Another nice one that he... Um, said he would change in that is um, instead of craving leads to grasping, he would prefer to translate it as wanting leads to taking up. And they're minor things, they seem like minor things, but actually the word wanting is much more inclusive and it has a deeper kind of more insidious sense about it because craving is a little bit coarse, but wanting is something that's always there right? Any wanting. It's not only the craving kind of wanting, it's wanting. Even wanting enlightenment, wanting jhanas is a wanting that's going to block you. And then the word upadana literally means taking up, uptake. So he said it's like the fuel, you know, that you put into a car. It's like what is taken up. I think grasping is also not bad. Um, but it's more like because you want something, you take it up. You know, and this can be subtle, right? Because we want something to happen. We take it up in our mind, even just as a thought or a concept or a general inclination. So it's just an example of how it's so helpful to be able to talk to people who have these deep experiences and clarify points of Dhamma. And this is also what the Akalyanamitta can be very helpful for. And then lastly, because I do want to get into some meditation, I think one of the really wonderful things in monastic life, if you are living in a community, is that you get to practice sila in the relational field, you know, through having Kalyanamitta, spiritual friends on the path, you get to do these little acts of kindness for each other. You know, you get to um, discuss the Dhamma, of course, but also learn how to live in harmony not in a way that leads to more busyness, but in a way that actually frees you up. So that because you're able to treat each other with respect and reverence, gentleness, look out for each other's little needs, you actually have more time to meditate. And when you go away to your private little space, your kuti or your hut in the forest or on the land that Anukampa wants to buy in the end, um, you don't carry all this kind of unfinished business with you. You know, you have a, a settled and calm and peaceful heart because you know that you're all in harmony together. You're all working to the same goal. You might not agree on everything, but, you know, the goodwill is there. The loving kindness is there. And then in the suttas, there's this lovely description about three monks who were at the time not enlightened and were working on the difficulties they had in the meditation, such as seeing lights in the mind and seeing forms and shapes and not being able to keep it steady. So they were having trouble with this. It's the Upakilesa Sutta. And uh, I think Majima um, 128, possibly, and uh, somewhere around there. And uh, and the Buddha asked them, how are they practicing mindfulness, actually? How are you practicing mindfulness? And they said, oh, when one of us needs something, we go to their assistance. And uh, 
you know, whoever gets back from the arms round first, they tidy up the place, they put out the water and the foot wiping cloths. And, uh, and then at the end of the meal, whoever's finished last, they just put out the rubbish. And, and so there was no arguing about anything. And then once every five days, they would sit together and have a really lovely Dhamma discussion. But the rest of the week, they'd just stay together in silence. And if they needed some help, they'd just kind of gesture, oh, can you come over here? But they would do it without breaking into speech. And then one of the things that I thought was really beautiful is um, they said that basically, although they were three in body, they acted like one in mind and they looked upon each other with kindly eyes. Yeah, I think Pia Chaku is the Pali. It's like loving eyes, eyes of loving kindness, if you want. Or you could say regarding each other with affection, but I think kindly eyes is a really beautiful way to translate it. And, um, and then, more than that, not only did they benefit from their relationship while they were, you know, in the relational field, they would go back to their kuti and meditate and they would bring up joy. So they would do the Sanganu Sati as they sat there to practice. They would say, oh, what a great gain it is for me. What a great gain that I'm living with such virtuous companions in the holy life. And they would recollect about their friends qualities and they would bring up that joy that mudita if you like you know through the reflection of the sangha the reflection on the sangha and the qualities of their friends and because of that it wasn't long i think it was one more rains retreat and the buddha came back at the end of that and asked them again how their meditation was and now they'd all managed to go beyond the jhanas right into i think full liberation and you know this was because of course, they had the Buddha as their main Kalyana Mitta, but it was very much around the way they were living together, the way they were applying the Dhamma in the relational field. And we can't learn that if we live alone. You know, I think we have to strike a balance between retreat time, which is very solitary, very silent, and time together as spiritual friends. And I guess my best retreats have often been in places where there is a lot of solitude, but there's also people around who I also know are practicing well and that are there if I need them. And they know that I'm there if they need me, you know, because without that, it can get a little bit dry. And just to finish up with one um, uh, example, I was thinking about Tenzin Palmo and about her time in the cave. She's the English nun who's about at least 70, probably 75 or so by now. And uh, she went to India like I did when she was 19. Um, but she was very drawn quickly to the Tibetan tradition and got the opportunity to ordain. So people talk about her time in that cave. She lived in the Himalayas at about, I don't know, 3000 plus meters altitude on her own, right? But before that, she was training for 12 years. She had six years in another monastery um, in the Himalayas, not quite as high up, where she was living with other nuns and she tried to practice as best she could, but it wasn't complete solitude. Before that, she was six years serving her teacher, kind of like in doing office work and facing a lot of obstacles due to, of course, being female and having a male teacher. She was often left out of the teachings and left out of the training that the monks would get. So she was basically like a secretary. And so it was that middle bit, that middle stepping stone when she was six years in the monastery in a slightly lower altitude place that she um, tried to develop deep meditation. And I think as far as I remember the story, it was only after she could get into the first jhana that the teacher let her go to that cave. So even there, you see, there was a lot of preparation. There was a lot of spiritual friendship. And by the time she went, she already had these qualities deep in her heart. And of course, someone was coming to bring food every so often. And people were looking out for her, you know. And it was a time of great and very deep solitude. But eventually she came back again. And then her inclination was to serve. So it's this beautiful balance, you know, always between the serving and the practice, the serving and the practice and trying to integrate the two. And that way we benefit not only ourselves, but so many other people on the path. And we can come together as we are here, you know, and share whatever we've learned, share our practice together, just share our good energy, our encouragement and, and kind thoughts. And that is an enormous support for our path. So that's all on Sanganu Sati. I'm sure we could give 
loads and loads of talks on that because there's also some beautiful books about the Buddha's disciples, which I haven't even touched, haven't even got into that at all. So maybe we'll do that after the retreat sometime. <laughs> Good. So meditation time. And as usual in these meditations, I tend to give a little bit more guidance perhaps or direction, suggestions than uh, in the morning. But if it doesn't speak to you, just let the words flow over your head. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. And with the help of your body, with the help of the sensations that you experience within. And with your eyes closed, just settling into your posture, settling into the present moment, the only place that really exists. Timeless zone when you get right inside. And taking care to make any adjustments that you need to at the beginning. Setting up that relationship of care between your body and your mind. And spreading kind awareness, loving awareness, just very gently through your body. Scanning each body part. And allowing any tensions just to relax, to drain away. As though you were basking in the sunshine, the sunshine of mindfulness and kindness. Regarding your body, your mind, with kindly eyes.
And if you wish, you may just continue this way. Focusing on the way you're aware and infusing that with kindness. Otherwise, I'd like to invite you to bring to mind a person who you have great confidence in as a good, virtuous, maybe even noble being. It doesn't have to be a monk or a nun. Anyone who inspires you perhaps who you take as a teacher or a benefactor or someone with a particular quality that's outstanding maybe this person has extraordinary kindness deep wisdom. A big, generous heart. Someone you really respect. and in whom you recognize qualities you'd like to develop in your own heart. Imagine you're sitting with this person now. And all they have in their mind is your own well-being your own progress on the path, your safety, your protection. Your happiness, your health. If you can't think of a living being that may be someone you've heard about or read about, or maybe an icon, a symbol of loving kindness, a Kuan Yin. And notice what happens when you hold up their qualities in front of your mind as though looking at a beautiful jewel, maybe a ruby or an emerald or sapphire, holding it up to the light for inspection with reverence, with awe. Can you sense the energetic resonance of that quality in your own heart as you tune up to it in this other person? Or perhaps a feeling that your heart lifts up toward it with inspiration with confidence.
You might even repeat very gently a word of this quality, such as kindness, or peace. And just listen into your body to the resonance of that word. Allowing it to gladden and brighten the mind. And if the mind is quiet and receptive enough for the breath, see if you can greet this breath too as a very good spiritual friend, worthy of reverence, worthy of respect, worthy of offering your time to of offering your kindness, your gentleness to. Perhaps imagining how a noble person, an enlightened person would regard the breath with confidence, kindness, without ownership or control. And 
allowing the breath to suffuse the whole mind. So the mind comes to rest with and inside the breath. Just being very kind to your mind if it wanders, if it's not ready for the breath. Just going back to hanging out with kindness. So you're sitting with a good spiritual friend. not judging yourself, just feeling fully accepted.
So we're coming close to the end of the meditation. Just bringing to mind once again this spiritual friend that you've been sitting with. If, if you follow that particular suggestion. And once again, connecting with the qualities you most admire and respect in them. Maybe sensing in or recognizing that quality in you as well. Imagining yourself just paying respects, bidding them farewell in whichever way seems appropriate, but keeping some of that peace, some of that inspiration, what they mean to you, keeping that within. Great, so question time, if you have anything left to say. <laughs> so please send in any question to Q&A Leone. <laughs> I see there's another question about Anukampa, but I, if, you, if possible, maybe you could be a little more specific because I felt I spoke quite a bit about that. I don't want to uh, repeat myself too much. <laughs> so maybe a specific question or we can talk about it also I'm sure we will towards the end of the retreat so yeah you are welcome to ask questions that are not about this evening's theme absolutely it can be any theme anything that's real for you that's going on for you please feel free to share so I'm following other types of Buddhism too, and I'm trying to decide on which path to follow. So I wanted to know, what's the difference between this path and others concerning helping others to also attain liberation? I'm not sure anymore, thanks. Yeah, me too. I've never been sure. I think it's an artificial division. Um, I think if somebody's really practicing the path, then there's going to be a natural desire and urge and almost impulse to help others um so i mean i think that what you're saying probably relates to the differences between theravada and mahayana but again those divisions came much later they didn't exist until buddhism started to travel to other countries so um theravada just means the word of the elders so it means like the word of the teras literally the teras were the enlightened monks and the teris were the enlightened nuns and later, when it traveled to Tibet and China and Taiwan, I guess, and Korea, it, the Mahayana um, branch started to use the word Hinayana to refer to the Theravada tradition, which means the lesser vehicle. 
But the word hina is actually a very misleading word because it, it's actually quite a negative word that means not only inferior, but something that's quite low. Like it's used in the suttas to denote a kind of very low sensual pleasure. So it's actually quite an inappropriate term and I think quite condescending in a sense. And I'm not sure how or why that started that way. Um, because the monks, the great nuns and monks I've met who practice to purify their heart simply start to remove selfishness from their heart. And the more they do that, the more they serve others. So the people I know who serve extensively in this world are, um, yeah, you could include the Dalai Lama. I also know nuns, you know, there are nuns in the Tibetan tradition, there's Burmese nuns who I know and lay teachers who I know who serve like anything, you know, even on a donation basis. And obviously my teacher, Ajahn Brahm, he serves like to such a degree that it's just, it's just totally, uh, what's the word, flabbergasting? <laughs> you just wonder how somebody can serve so much without completely burning out. So I don't think there is really a difference. Um, I think one of the differences with the Bodhisattva sattva ideal of the later tradition, the later Mahayana tradition, is that they talk about maybe delaying their enlightenment for the sake of others, or maybe there are other kind of philosophies there that suggest that they believe they're already enlightened, but they can keep coming back to help others. But this doesn't really sit with the suttas because once you once there's no more wanting, no more craving, it just doesn't seem like possible, according to the law of nature, to take rebirth again. So um, either way, I don't think we have the control to decide to delay our liberation or to keep coming back. It's really not in our hands. The main thing is just to, whatever you learn, try to help others with it, you know, whatever you learn, put it into practice, make sure you benefit yourself and others. That's what the Buddha said is the best thing to do. So yeah, anything that only benefits you isn't really fulfilling virtue. Anything that only benefits another, but not you, that isn't real virtue either. But those acts that benefit both you and others, that is true virtue. And we're talking about long-term benefit, benefit that's you know, more than just physical, but also spiritual and emotional benefit as well. Okay. So, I would be really grateful if you could share a little about how you came to the decision to become a bhikkhuni and how did you confirm that it is the right thing and the right time. Oh, it wasn't the right time, I can tell you that. It was at least 18 years too late, but then maybe that was the right time. <laughs> it was 18 years after my volition that that was all I wanted to do with my life. <laughs> and so this is why it's a very different trajectory for monks and nuns quite often. So I don't think it was really a decision. I think it was more a calling. It was something very deep in my heart that felt like that was what I was here to do. You know, after I did my first retreat, basically, and I heard stories about monks and nuns, and I heard that, you know, such things existed. I think I knew that because I was already in Asia, living in India, and uh, I'd been to Thailand. So, yeah, I already knew there were such things as monks and nuns. Um, but it was during my first meditation retreat when I realized the power of the practice and um, basically that the only way out of suffering is, is inside. We're not going to find happiness in the outside world. And I knew this was my path. I knew it was what I'd always been looking for, even though I was only 20, but it was as though I'd finally found a path at the end of goodness knows what, I was only 20, right? But maybe it's many lives, that was the feeling. And maybe also I've been practicing in many lives before because it's, kind of a strange decision to make at that age if you're not coming from a Buddhist background or a Buddhist culture. Why did I go to India, you know, when I was 19? I really don't know. There's no logical reason. It just seemed like, let's go to India. Um, <laughs> but once I did my retreat, I knew why, you know. It's like, this is everything I've been looking for. This is why whatever happened before leading up to this had to happen to bring me here. I was so, so sure about that. So the decision was there. Um, but the actual opportunity didn't come along for another 10 years to ordain in Burma um, as what's officially called a novice nun, really. I mean, it's the nun's platform of ordination in Burma, but it's not officially recognized, you know, 
as a member of the Sangha. So I already ordained eight years before I took bikini ordination. And I only had the opportunity to ordain as a bikini um, after coming to Perth. So it took a long, long time. Am I answering the question though? How did I come to the, it's the way you've put it, I suppose it's asking about a decision, but I don't think that's what you mean. Um, basically, I just wanted to know why we're here, why we suffer and what the point of it is, you know? And when I heard the teachings, it answered that for me. And I, I decided I don't just want to, you know, find out a little bit. This is the point of my whole life. Let's see how far I can go. And because I was so young and I was in Asia and, you know, I felt kind of like there was nothing to lose in a sense. I just decided to, yeah, pursue that for the rest of my life and make sure I didn't do anything that would uh, preclude the opportunity to ordain. So, so that's kind of how it happened. <laughs> I don't know, nothing more is coming from me at the moment. It's funny, sometimes you sort of try and think of things. Actually, I don't think of things. It just either comes or it doesn't come. So that's all that's coming. But do ask again if you want more detail about my journey. <laughs> what would be a wise perspective on blame? Well, Ajahn Chah says it's like having an itch on your head and scratching your bum. So that's one perspective. <laughs> because uh, it doesn't help anyone and it doesn't solve the problem. The problem is usually inside. So when we blame others, we're, um, or when we blame ourselves, we're, we're just adding suffering to suffering, you know. It's like the suffering's already there, the thing that happened already happened. And really we want to try to find the cause of that and, and sometimes also to make sure it doesn't happen again. But blaming doesn't help because blaming just generates negativity. And as long as there's negativity in the mind, we actually don't see things very clearly. So I think a better perspective would be to try to understand that things only happen because, you know, due to causes and quite often people do things they don't really want to do but it's due to a lack of mindfulness, it's due to a lack of wisdom, a lack of reflection. And oftentimes they're doing the best they can. We're doing the best we can, you know, we're making the best choice out of the choices we see in front of us. We don't always see other choices that may have been available, but we just didn't see them, you know? And sometimes we can only know that afterwards. We only know we've made a mistake once we've made it. So I think we have to be really lenient with ourselves and others. Um, in terms of making mistakes, because otherwise we'll be just uh, punishing ourselves and punishing everyone else when we slip up. So we have to expect mistakes to happen and expect people to do the wrong thing, expect ourselves to do the so-called wrong thing from time to time and uh, learn forgiveness instead, learn forgiveness. Hmm. How does one find a teacher? This is a lay person. Even for a monastic, it's hard, I have to say. What is the etiquette when asking and how does it work? That's fine. That's all one question. <laughs> how does one find a lay teacher? What's the etiquette when asking and how does it work? Yeah, I don't think there is much of an actual formal procedure for lay people to find teachers. I think it's more that you find someone who you take as a teacher in your heart um, and it's something that either happens or it doesn't you know sometimes you just find a teacher who either you love their teachings or if you're really fortunate you also can see their example the example of the teachings in that person as well and then it becomes quite beautiful and quite alive and then I would say you just simply listen to their teachings as much as you can you know um, you come to their talks, you come to their retreats, and over time, you know, you ask questions and you get to know them that way. Very few teachers I know have the time or the capacity to take on so-called personal students and train them like as such, um, simply because they're such a limited resource. Um, but it's the regularity, because that way you get to know them, they get to know you, and then when you ask the questions, they can usually tune in a bit better to where you're coming from and to the answer that you're sort of, that may be of help. Um, 
to have an actual teacher that you, I'm not quite sure what you mean. Are you probably talking about a more formal relationship? Because you're saying as a lay person. Um, I'm not sure it really exists unless you go to, a, unless you search around different traditions, they may have particular procedures. Um, but really it's only in monastic life that you get to live with a teacher. And that's only if you're, unfortunately, I was gonna say lucky, but quite frankly, male often because there aren't that many teachers and that's the situation I'm in you know I did have um, a teacher in Burma who accepted monks and nuns so it wasn't an issue the gender wasn't an issue in any way and I had perfectly conducive conditions in terms of receiving the teachings and also the requisites as long as I was there um, but the problem in Burma was the climate after some time and I got very sick so I had to leave and then the issue is you know that uh you're kind of on your own again, especially if you're not a bikini and there's no kind of um, support network in place for you. So the way I found Ajahn Brown was completely by chance. Somebody put his talks on some CDs when I'd visited England and I just kind of put them on the back shelf because I thought, yeah, these Western monks, they don't really know what they're talking about. You know, I've been around the great masters in Asia and you've got to be Asian to be enlightened. <laughs> I had that kind of bias, you know, <laughs> honestly speaking. And maybe also because I'd heard some talks from other teachers, other Western monks, and it just did nothing for me, really. I mean, it was kind of nice, but it wasn't getting at the real heart of the thing. And anyway, one day, I don't know, maybe I was feeling a bit frustrated by trying to keep up with everything in Burmese and the climate and all the rest. And I thought, let's just try something different. Let me put on one of these CDs. And it happened to be this person called Ajahn Brahma Bam. So I thought, okay, whoever. And uh, the first talk I heard was like the best explanation I'd ever heard for body contemplation, as in looking at the body in, the, in terms of unattractiveness which is not one of my favorite topics. It's not one that I think I particularly need to do, um, but the way it was put was far deeper than anything I'd heard. And then I thought, okay, this is interesting. Let me hear another talk. And by the second talk, I just had waves of PT and just tears in my eyes. It was like, this is my teacher. <laughs> it just spoke straight to the heart. It was like every cell was absorbing kind of nectar. I don't know how to explain, it was just, I just had a sense it was coming from a very deep place. And I was also doing a lot of meditation at the time. So perhaps that was why it had such a deep impact, but also, I guess also speaking, you know, it being in English meant it just sunk in so easily. And also something in the way he was presenting the Dhamma. And I don't know, it's, sometimes it's like a recognition almost of someone that you need to learn from. And yeah, a few months later, I just took a leap of faith and decided to leave and see where, if I could find Ajahn Brahm. And I still didn't actually really know who he was. I did a tiny bit, yeah, in Burma at that time, you, you, I would do like half an hour internet every month because it was a three hour kind of journey into the city and really hot and humid. So I never really went in and it was a very austere life. So I just checked a little bit and um, yeah, it was only after that that I found out he'd ordained bikinis and I thought, oh, really? So, oh, so you should, so there's a chance to be a bikini because it had never even occurred to me before. And because he said he'd made the chance, I thought, this must be a good thing. <laughs> so it's kind of the opposite for me, opposite way to come to him perhaps. But, uh, but it's very serendipitous and most even bikinis and monks, they don't necessarily feel they have a teacher like there may be a teacher at the monastery but whether they have a deep relationship or whether they always enjoy their teachings I'm not so sure so I think like Ajahn Brahmali says the best bet is the Buddha and then if you can come to some online teachings or you know uh, try to come to various different teachers and maybe if you find something you like just go to them a little bit more and of course, what we're trying to do with the monastery and why we need monasteries is because at least monasteries have resident teachers. So if you do find a connection with somebody, you can visit that place again and again, and you can have more regular contact. So that's the idea also of a monastery that there becomes a little bit more of a stable community, people that you get to know, community that you get to know, a certain energy that you may or may not resonate with. And then a teacher that if you like their teachings, you know, you build a relationship 
and you can have them more like a spiritual friend along your journey along the way. So that's just a little bit of reflection. How do you recommend in watching the breath? I was taught to watch the breath at the tip of the nose, but this is quite difficult. Yes, indeed, it is quite difficult. So I was taught in the beginning in the Gwenk system to watch the breath here. Not here, but here, because this is the place where you can feel the breath coming in and out. And the thing with that technique is that we were more taught to feel the sensations in this area. And it took me a long time to realize, as in 14 years or something, to realize that actually by watching the sensations and by starting to see the nature of impermanence in those sensations, I was actually doing Vipassana, not really Samatha. So it started to get to the point in my practice where there was no difference between breath meditation and body meditation or Vedana Nupassana because everything was just dissolving all the time. So the breath object as an object wasn't stable enough to take me into deep samadhi. And it was only after unpacking this for a few years with various teachers like Bhante Ujagra was the first who told me I have to start to watch the breath as a concept. I was like, the breath as a concept? What's that? That sounds really weird because I'm saying the breath is it's in the ultimate reality, you know, we're trained in the Burmese tradition to think that that's the deeper reality. Um, but it's just one reality, it's just one perception actually. Um, and that perception wasn't really conducive for jhana states of mind. So in order to come back to the point where I could see the breath more as a concept, more as just breath rather than feelings, um, I started not to locate the breath anymore but just to experience breath as breath. And one of my teachers, Shaila Catherine, I'm doing a little online course with her, which I'm very behind with actually. <laughs> but um, she has a nice phrase. She says that um, your object is the basic occurrence of the breath. It's the basic occurrence of the breath. The fact the breath is going in or going out. So it may be co-joined with feelings. It may, you may have some sensations around it. May, you may feel like, warmth or coolness or some tingling in the beginning but you don't make that the focus you make the fact of the breath the focus and in that way it doesn't really matter where it is um, some teachers teach that it can be helpful to actually move it a little bit away from the body but I even think that that's too much fiddling around I think it's better to just be aware of whether you're breathing in or breathing out and don't worry about where you're watching the breath because knowing is what you want to cultivate. You know, in the Anapanasati Sutta, it says one knows one is breathing in long breath or a short breath, one knows, right? It's the knowing of the breath that's important. And knowing doesn't happen in a place. Knowing is not located somewhere. Knowing is what the mind does. So I think it's better to just learn to know that breath and don't worry too much about the sensations or where it is because that will start to fade away anyway over time. And you'll be just left with this perception of breath, which becomes more and more refined to the point where you don't even know, it doesn't even matter really if it's in or out, it's just breath. And it becomes much more like a um, stable perception. It becomes more and more stable until it gets very subtle and then starts to fade. So this is kind of where the breath meditation should be going if you want to go into Samadhi. Whereas with Vipassana, the sensations just get more and more and more. <laughs> so, and at the whole, everything starts to just vibrate. At goodness knows how many, you know, very fast, put it that way. It, it vibrates very fast. And after a while, I just realized, wow, I need a change of perception here because my mind can only see it that way. So, but it took me like at least two or three years to stop feeling it like dissolving. So, yeah, one of my teachers actually said, you have to make your mind stupid. That was Bhante Jagara, <laughs> Diana, for Diana's sake. Yeah, he said, you have to make your mind kind of stupid. Like, don't bother analyzing it or, because my mind's very analytical. Like, I want to know what and why and how it's working and get into the nitty gritty. But he said, no, 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 he just, breath coming in, going out, breath. So it's... It involves quite a simple mind. We have to make our minds, I wouldn't say stupid, but simple, very simple. Okay. I'm gonna do the meditation ones if I can, because there's a lot and I'm not sure I'm gonna get through everything. 
Um, I'll see what I can do. Uh, in meditation, when the mind moves away from the breath, is it enough to just notice that, or is it useful to bring the attention back to the breath? Please clarify. I think it's always different and only you can really know. I think there are no hard and fast rules and that it's good to experiment what works for you. Um, sometimes the mind moves away from the breath and it's not very difficult to bring it back. It's just enough to notice that it's gone and it's back again. And that's great, that's fine, because your mind obviously wants to be with the breath. Sometimes it might move away from the breath for long periods of time and it gets absorbed and involved in all kinds of other things. And it's, and that can be because it's simply not ready to watch the breath. You know, There's not enough brightness in the mind. There are not enough preparations in place. Um, and at that time, it might not be helpful to bring it back if it becomes a struggle. You know, if it, if it becomes a struggle and you start to feel like this is really not fun, this is really creating tension and, you know, it's just monotonous, then it might be helpful to just try something else. And my second two methods mostly are to either, usually number one is to just be with the body again and to go through the body, do some body scanning because this really is a great way to start developing mindfulness. You know, the feelings are quite tangible, they're very obvious, um, and there's a lot going on. So if you move your attention through the body, like part by part by part, this is my Goenkaji conditioning, but Ajahn Brahm does it too, um, and you just feel what's happening in the body, then that gives the mind a bit more uh, leeway. You know, you're not holding your mind in just one place. So your mind might feel a bit more relaxed and it also helps to um, increase the mindfulness. So I often do that to pacify the hindrances if I'm restless or if I'm tired, I do that first and I relax the body and bring about a more relaxed feeling and a bit more uh, mindfulness. And then when the mind's ready, it normally goes to the breath. And of course, the other method you can use is loving kindness. And that's especially helpful if you find you're inundated with thoughts, but you know, um, sometimes sometimes it can be nice to just, instead of trying to move the thoughts away, to just say, okay, well, my mind wants to think, so why don't we let it think about something useful? <laughs> and instead you just say some nice words of love and kindness to yourself, because at least in that way, you're, you know, you're avoiding going down the channel of unwholesome thoughts. So there's a few tips but I think you know there's no hard and fast rule and just try different things try different things yeah if it becomes like a tug of war I would say it's not very helpful I did that for many years with um, the Vipassana practice like the first three days of every retreat was just Anapana and then in the long retreats it was like 10 days of Anapana and it was always like observe each and every breath and when the mind wanders bring it back and I'm sure I never got beyond about three or four breaths you know and yet when I went to Vipassana I was like with it the whole time, like I was like aware all day, even walking, eating, even sleeping sometimes. So I don't know why it was just not the right method of breath meditation for me. But then there have been other times, you know, with Ajahn Brahm's method also where I have dared just occasionally to do really nothing. And I know there have been questions about that. Is that not a bit strange? Should we not have some Vitaka Vichara? But occasionally I have actually dared to do nothing and I have gone sort of through a drowsy period for two or three days. And after that, I remember there was one retreat and for a whole two weeks after that, there was like no thinking and just complete bliss. I mean, I'd never had that before that when there's just no thinking without any effort and without any effort to be with the breath, it was really interesting. So, yeah, I don't know. I think there are different things we can experiment with. I wouldn't say it's always one or the other. Uh, okay, do you note the beginning, middle and end of the breath and then the same for the out breath? Again, uh, I think there are different ways to do this. I don't personally um, because I've never really worked much with noting. So, but I think for me, the difference between observing the in-breath and the out-breath or long and short breath, first of all, in breath long, in breath short, out breath long, out breath short, and then it moves to the whole breath. Um, to me, that just happens naturally when the mindfulness increases. 
So rather than just knowing, okay, there's a breath and then wandering off somewhere in the middle of the breath, you just realize, oh, I'm really with this breath now. And for me, it's almost like a perception of, sometimes I like to use this perception, like the breath is like a pillow and I'm starting to get comfortable with it. And then I just lay my head on that breath. So I just go with it, Ooh, you know, in, out, in, out, just floating with it like that. Um, and what's the other perception I like to use? It came and now it's gone. One is the being with the pillow thing. Oh yeah, the other perception is like, almost like a very, almost subverbal intention to give trust to the breath, to give my trust to the breath. It's like to give your heart to the breath or to give your, yeah, your whole body or your whole heart, your trust to the breath. So you're giving to it. And again, that sort of lands me on it. And then the breath is like, this thing that you're riding, it's almost like you're riding a wave. So I don't usually note it, but you can, you can, if you wish to. But you'd probably have to find some shorter words than that. Otherwise you'll never say all that in one breath. <laughs> you could be like one, 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 two, two, two. But Ajahn Brahmali would say, don't do that. But that's just interesting because both Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Brahmali always say don't. But I know Ajahn Brahm started by doing a lot of counting. So it's quite interesting because I often think they're speaking more from where they are now than how they got to where they are. So I think you can try different things. Just the reason that Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Brahmali both teach like that is because, um, and me too, I need to be honest, I would also say do less, is because we tend to do too much. Most of us but you might be different and you might need a tiny bit of noting. So it's very personal and it changes at different times according to your mood, time of day, practice, <laughs> character, so many things. So, Okay, there's a couple of questions about going to Asia and um, one is talking about ordaining in Sri Lanka and one is asking about going to retreats in Asia and worried about the treatment of women in Theravada countries. So the really sad thing here is that if what is happening in Myanmar was not happening in Myanmar, I would wholeheartedly recommend going to that wonderful, wonderful country for a long retreat because it really is like the shining bright light in Asia for women who want to practice meditation, especially in long retreats. I've never been to a country which felt safer for women, you know, and I'm talking about as a traveler, but I, I think even for the Burmese women, they're not as mistreated as they are in other countries, say like India. Um, generally speaking, they seem fairly strong and quite empowered. Of course, it's still a very patriarchal country with a lots of, toxic, violent masculinity, obviously. Um, but this is, I don't know whether that's about masculinity as much as about, you know, living under a military dictatorship in a impoverished country and getting conscripted to things like the horrible army there. So a lot of those people have no choice but to be in that um, terrible position. And of course they get indoctrinated and brainwashed and asked to do terrible things. So this is very sad. And I think this is one of the reasons that the situation there should concern us all, because if we lose, if the Myanmar people lose, first of all, their peace, which they certainly have for the time being, and their safety, we also lose, you know, all the lineages, all the practice opportunities that are there. I mean, it's a country that you go to and you just feel like there's a retreat center or a monastery on every corner. And it is like that. There are monasteries on every corner of every street, you know, and retreat centers all over the place where you can stay for long periods of time and men and women can stay and practice. And also in many places, monks and nuns, although fewer, but almost all meditation centers have men and women. So, um, but that's not an option at the moment. So Thailand, I know a bit less about. I've been to some of the forest monasteries, and uh, it's true that if there are made cheese there, which are like the eight precept nuns, they're usually in the kitchen doing a lot of cooking for the monks. But um, some of them also do have quite a lot of practice opportunities. And I think if you're going as a, a foreign visitor, um, you may get those practice opportunities as well. 
So Thailand could be okay. Uh, where else? Sri Lanka. I haven't actually been to Sri Lanka. It's crazy because a lot of our supporters are Sri Lankan, but I guess I found the Dhamma in India and I just stayed there most of the time and then Burma. So uh, Sri Lanka could be a good opportunity. You know, and if you're really concerned about the treatment of women in those countries, you could always get involved in some kind of charity project or something. Um, I think still it would be quite conducive for long retreats on the whole in either Thailand or, or Sri Lanka. Uh, what was the other question about ordaining bhikkhunis in Sri Lanka? Yes, some monks do ordain bhikkhunis in Sri Lanka. I did get a figure at one point, I think it's about a thousand or so that are there now. Um, there are many more thousand who are not bhikkhunis, uh, so bhikkhunis are still a minority and they still don't get um, equal opportunities. They're not regarded as sangha <laughs> in the sense that they don't get support from the state or identity cards and free bus passes and things like that. So it's still not fair, not right, um, equal by any means. And not all monks support it. So, um, but yeah, there are bhikkhuni ordinations there. Okay. There was another question about the project and I kind of feel like coming to that afterwards because someone's asking about new developments and nothing new has happened since the start of this retreat. This is the new development. We are the new development and I think that's a good way to see it really because who knows what might happen from here. So yeah, these are the things we do. It's kind of a, a, a case of just a little bit along the way and actually big, things like this are quite big because this is the outcome of many, many months of preparation and uh, putting things together. So it's a journey that we're on. Um, and as I said before, we need quite a lot more funds and before we can actually have a permanent place. And I also need more people on the ground, including nuns. So if I would move into a big place and have the admin load that I have and the teaching load that I have and a monastery to run, I think I would probably collapse within about a week. So um, <laughs> this is not normally the way things happen. So we need more help and we need more support. So it's really our monastery. Um, it's everybody's monastery. And I really invite you all warmly on board to make this thing happen because it will happen and we're not gonna give up. So it's just a matter of time. <laughs> so I think there was one more little thing which I might be able to get to. Uh, and someone's asking about Buddhist pilgrimages. So <laughs> comment of Ajahn Brahm comes to mind now. But basically, of course, the first thing that came to mind were the four um, pilgrimage sites in India. Uh, so the birth place of the Buddha, Lumbini, the place of his enlightenment, Bodh Gaya, um, the place where he taught the first sermon and the second one, that's the Dhammachaka and the Anatta Lakana Sutta. I don't think the next one, Fire Sermon, I think was somewhere else. Uh, and that's Sarnath. And then the last one is where he passed away in uh, Kushinagar. And that is uh, all in Northern India in the Ganges Valley near Gaia, that sort of area of Varanasi. Um, and you can also go to the museum in New Delhi, which I thought, why are we bothering? But it was really fantastic because we meditated with the bone relics of the Buddha. I don't know, it was very amazing. Maybe the whole pilgrimage was amazing because I went with Ajahn Pramali and uh, another two monks and three, bhikkhu, three other bhikkhunis. So there were four bhikkhunis and three monks. And we went there together with a group of lay people from Perth. And uh, it was fabulous. Can you imagine having Ajahn Pramali give talks in every place that the Buddha lived and spent time giving the suttas from, that the Buddha gave in those places, you know? Oh, it was so good. <laughs> and of course, explaining it all, you know, and saying, yeah, once upon a time, the Buddha was dwelling at Savati and Jota's Grove, and it's like, you're there. <laughs> it was really great. Yeah, it was, I was honestly, every pilgrimage site, I had tears, but that's my personality, but it is very moving. Mm. It's not actually my personality, I'm not like crying all everywhere. This is powerful. But the Buddha says, <laughs> uh, not the Buddha, Ajahn Brahm says the real four holy sites are the first, second, third, and fourth jhana. 
So that's another Buddhist pilgrimage that you can do, but that's a bit harder. You can't make travel arrangements. You can't make sure the bus comes on time. You can't make sure it doesn't get a flat tire. So that's a bit more out of your control. So, but either way, maybe you could do both together. <laughs> okay. I think I've probably talked long enough and now I'm getting a bit silly. So, <laughs> but it's really nice to talk with you all and it's good fun. So I enjoyed that and I hope that you did. And I hope that you go to sleep with a very beautiful conscience, free from remorse, with this beautiful sense of living your best life, uh, values aligned life and reflecting on the beautiful benefits and blessings in your life, the friends on the path, whether they're enlightened yet or not, and this wonderful opportunity we have to be together. So let's make use of the last few days. Still a lot of retreat time to go. So take care everyone and good night. <laughs>